That's my game show host song that I'm doing. How does that sound? Hello and welcome to a cooking demonstration for the Incredible Brothers Dream Foundation. My name is Nathan Lyon. I am an Emmy nominated chef from Arlington, Virginia. I have a health science degree with a public health minor, and I completed a course to become a medical technician. And I was like, nope. But then I decided to become a chef and I've worked with farmers for over 10 years. That, that is a speed dating introduction, I would say. And this is maybe, maybe our first date. Maybe this is your first time joining us today. Who is us, do you say? Well, there's myself, of course, Nathan Lyon, there's the Debbie Stream Foundation. Of course, there's Mary Eve Brown. And Mary Eve is a clinical oncology dietitian at John Hopkins at the Kimball Cancer Center. How is everyone doing out there? And uh, Mary Eve, how are you? And how's your Thanksgiving? Good question. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it was was um, an awesome, awesome day. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like both of us to a certain point are still like we have a little tryptophan in our system. It was amazing. It was an incredible day. <laughs> but that's okay, because we still have a little bit of coffee. Uh, I am in Austin, Texas, along with the person behind the scenes, this voice, which is Sarah Foreman. Hello, everybody. Now, Sarah Foreman is very important, not just to me and our little long-haired mini Dawson uh, <laughs> little guy, but she's also the conduit to enable your questions to have voice, okay? So any sort of questions you have for either myself or Mary Eve or for Sarah or our, or our Dawson, Type it on in the chat box, and then Sarah will relay your questions, be they cooking or not, health related clearly to Mary Eve. And then Sarah will ask those questions. Then we will have this lovely, very adventurous dialogue. So that sounds pretty cool. I hope everyone out there had a lovely and restful Thanksgiving. Uh, we are between the family time, whether or not you hosted Thanksgiving or didn't, and you have to for Christmas and or New Year's or Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate, all are welcome here, okay? So let's see, I guess that's it, right? I just ripped through that introduction like it was out of, out of style and out of business. Speaking of style, yes, this shirt is one of the only <laughs> shirts that actually fits me pretty well, and that, that's, it's a nice, it's a nice day. It's a nice- Are these holiday glasses, the red? Yeah, right, they pop. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. oh, weather outside is 83 <laughs> degrees here in Austin, Texas, and it's 94% humidity. That being said, we are going to be making some things that are autumnal in nature. If you've seen me uh, cook before here with Baby Stream Foundation or in television, wherever, you'll know that I like to cook in season because that is the way Mother Nature intended, and it is the least uh, expensive way to eat, but it's also the most nutritive way to eat because everything in season, lots of nutrients, and that's what the body wants to eat anyway. So when it's really cold out and you want to turn on the oven, that's why things like, I don't know, say winter squashes are on offer. And that's one of the things we'll be cooking today. Okay. So speaking of that winter squash, butternut squashes and other types of winter squashes, kabocha squash, delicata squash, have been showing up en masse sometimes in the form of, of a pumpkin pie, pumpkin, you know, you never know these things, but you can roast all of them and all of them are quite delicious, okay? But let me let me show you what I like to do with a butternut squash. Loretta says, good morning, love the red glasses watching from California and the foothills near Yosemite. Snow is expected this weekend. Oh my gosh, yeah, the whole, the whole uh, don't nerd me out because I'm a weather nerd, don't get me started. The whole West Coast is going to get some nice moisture coming up in the next handful of days, but I'm really excited about. That's where a lot of our food comes from. And I was in LA for 20 years working with farmers. Love it. And um, uh, sorry, one yeah, more. Please. Andrea, um, uh, Debbie Dream Foundation's very own Andrea Edelman is saying hello to everybody. You know, we are one big happy family. And after all the love and kisses and family tidings, we all get kind of hungry. So thus, this big bad Larry. Um, a couple things. Sometimes they can have fairly thick skins. Sometimes we all can, let's be honest. You can also get um, these butternut squash already peeled and diced on offer at your grocery store. I would say almost every grocery store nowadays has them on. If you don't want to take on, if you're not in the mood for 
<laughs> that's Mary E. Stocksy. Mary E. Stocksy. <laughs> that's Scout. Doxy. Scout's got to let you know she's here. So. Yeah, and, uh, listen, all Doxies are welcome in this forum. So Sorry. when I'm peeling these harder squashes, what I'd like to do is, if you <laughs> before, keep in mind that um, the peelers have two sets of blades, one for left-handed people by peeling this way, right? So I'm pushing that way. And I'm right-handed, so I'm pushing that way. If you find that your peeler isn't very sharp, try pulling it up toward yourself. Because more times than not, that blade has barely been used, mostly if you're a right-handed person. And if you're a left-handed person, do the same, because that means the other blade uh, hasn't been used either. It just makes quick work of something that may take a little bit longer. But you know what? It's the holiday season. If your blade is like the old school blade, that's all metal, like a loop of metal, that my grandmother used to use, and it's literally a hand-me-down from your grandmother. Take this from a uh, Papa Christmas a one. Hanukkah <laughs> guy. Get yourself a new peel. I, <laughs> I think it's time. Cooking. The other thing I do, Chef, is I will microwave it for a bit to soften oh. it. Um, that way, it's it, it's going to be a, it'll have a little bit more give. It won't be as woody to get through. Fantastic. Yeah. That's very very good advice. Unfortunately. I wish we had room for a microwave, but it's like, like no, maybe microwave should go in the ceiling and I should like pull a chain and the microwave could come <laughs> down. Like, that would um, be a good use of space. The other thing I would say is if you're in treatment, um, you know, actively getting, you know, chemotherapy um, soon to go to surgery, soon out of surgery, I caution people of using per cut produce in a grocery store, because I don't know if that's going to be safe from a food standpoint. And if my immune system is low um, or compromised, I don't want to put myself at any, any risk. So it's just a thought. In that case, food for thought, I would, instead of using a butternut squash, like the pre-cut ones, if you don't mind putting a little elbow grease, or you have someone in the household that doesn't mind it, kids, grandkids, you know, nieces and nephews that literally have Uncle Nathan, nothing to do. There's nothing to do in the most amazing time in human existence that you literally have every piece of information and entertainment at your fingertips. I'm bored. Peel this bad boy. Or if you don't want to, you can literally sub pound for pound a delicata squash, which is sort of like a long thing that doesn't have this bulbous end. And you can eat the peel. So you can just go ahead and chop that in half, scoop it all out, and not even worry about peeling that whatsoever. So that's also a really good alternative for your like winter squash soup, okay? The other is frozen, right? So you were talking about eating seasonally. Yeah. So right, if we're eating things that are grown in our area, less nutrient loss. If I'm eating something that's grown in Chile, lots of nutrient loss, because as soon as something is harvested, I start to lose the nutrition of that. But the frozen things are have a very short harvest to, to freeze. So that would be the other thing. And you can buy butternut squash frozen, already cut up, ready to go in the freezer. You know, that's a brilliant, brilliant idea. I feel like we should just cut this off right now. I'm going to go to the grocery <laughs> store and just save myself a little bit of time. You're exactly right. If you don't feel like doing this now, I feel like I should go back to culinary school or you and I, that we talked about this last time, Mary Eve, should hit the road in the Debbie's Dream Foundation van and just cook across the country 2023. DGF. I think with our Dotsons. Yes. With our Dotsons, exactly. With our little, with our little Loxons. Any questions so far? We have Melanie here, New Jersey in the house. Oh, New Jersey, best tomatoes. What? Okay. So where I am right now with this squash, I'm not going to do the whole thing. You know, just not going to do that whole thing. This big bad Larry, I can just roast the whole thing off. You know, I might, I might go ahead and cook it off with a little bit of uh, butter or olive oil. There's a lot, there's just so much that can happen with one of these things. And plus they're like three and a half to four pounds. And there's just Sarah and myself. I'll pop this in the fridge. It'll last a couple of weeks, no problem. Okay. So that's another really good point. If when you're looking at the butternut squash, the longer the neck, the more meat you're going to get from it. And so the smaller, the, the, the bulb part of it, you know, there's going to be seeds and part you're going to remove. So I always try to buy the one that has the longest neck on it to yeah. get the most, yeah. Absolutely. There's a squash out there for the Californians or people that have like a farmer's market, local farmer's market area that have a lot of different varieties. There's one called the Tahitian squash. If you've ever seen, I've, I've walked through airports with two of these things wrapped around my neck. There's the bulb. True, true story. The bulb is the same size, but the neck just goes really yeah. like a swan. 
when I just hook one over here, we're walking through. Not that I like attention <laughs> as the youngest of three boys. These should light up to get more attention, but you are such so, such a shy person. It's hard you know, to draw anything out days. of you. He'll come out of his shell one, one of these days. days Mary, I will come out of this shell. The shell that is known as this bald head. So right. while what is your next step? Because I have a question for Mary Eve. And okay, while you're doing that. Gotcha. So the next step will be I'm gonna put this in the bowl, a uh, little bit of salt and olive oil, and I'm gonna lay it on a sheet pan. The sheet pan I've prepped with some foil. That's just simply for easy cleanup and some parchment paper. Pop it in the oven at 370, uh, 475, all right? Take it away. Okay, question for Mary Eve. My single non-cooking uncle is scheduled for a total gastrectomy in the next few weeks. I would like to help with his meals for recovery. I'm unsure what he can eat. He's mainly eaten fast food or processed food for the majority of his life. What would you advise me to prepare for him? Okay, great. Um, I, when I think of this, I think of kind of doing small individual portions of like dinners um, and putting them in the freezer. So he can just pop it in the microwave, heat it up. And what you want to have there is some type of easy to digest protein. So ground is going to be easier to digest. So ground turkey, ground chicken, you know, ground beef. I would have some kind of veg there that's easy to digest without skins or seeds. So like a green bean, a carrot, um, a squash is perfect. And then some type of other carbohydrate, maybe potato or rice or pasta. And I would have it be moistened. So either a sauce or a gravy gravy with that. The other thing I would, I would stock his pantry with like easy things like nut butters and crackers, individual portions of like hot cereals, cream of wheat or, or, or oatmeal. Um, tuna, applesauce, um, like peach cups, but no, they, after surgery, you can't do anything that has a lot of sugar in it. So it's going to need to be in its own juice or, you know, unsweetened. Um, other things to put in the freezer would be like waffles, pancakes, you know, he can just pop those into a, into a toaster. Some people after surgery can do dairy and some cannot, if he can do dairy cheeses, like you can, um, buy, cheese sticks, like mozzarella cheese sticks or cheese cubes, the simpler, the better. If he's going to have to do any kind of preparation to something, he ain't going to do it. And he's not going to be able to rely on fast food. That's just going to make him feel really sick. Um, the other thing, if he's, if he's never been a person who prepared meals for himself, and actually I just took it off of my refrigerator because I grew up in a house where my dad would post the menu for the week and I do the same, same thing still. I would do that on his fridge. Like, Uncle Joe, these are breakfast choices. Pancakes, waffles, hot cereal, hard boiled egg. These are lunch options, freezers, dinners, you know, and, and give him a guideline so that he can see, oh, I need to be doing this. And then definitely he needs to snack because they can't eat large meals at any one time. So it's going to be, what are my snack choices? Oh, it can be peanut butter crackers. Oh, it can be a cheese stick. But to, to give him the guidelines is really the key because he's not a person who's done this before. It's going to sit in there and he's not going to use it. The other would be is, is it possible to eat with him? So people who after surgery are not having a great appetite and don't want to eat, they don't want to eat by themselves. So if you live locally or, or, or can, even setting up like we are here on a computer, right? So I could be sitting in my kitchen and eating and Uncle Joe can be sitting in his kitchen and eating and we're eating together. You know what? I feel that's something we should do. Just, just us, Mary. I think that we should set it up, and we should have Zoom cooking, eating. But like, I just think every day. I think you're right. When people, the whole, the whole phrase of like breaking bread together, it's hard to break bread with yourself, you know. And so there's something about the the physiological attachment to dining with somebody else. And you're exactly right. Through Zoom, through this technology, when I watch someone else eating at their table, I feel like I'm part of it, even though we're literally a thousand miles away. So I think it's very really smart. And also one of the things that, that we advise when we're out there cooking in front of people is exactly that, which is, you know, getting together with your whole family and with your kids that don't like to eat different types of foods. You sit down at the beginning of the week and you say, you know, what do you want for dinner tomorrow night? What do you want for the next night? So that everyone agrees and you have it up on the fridge. So I think that's genius. So it doesn't really matter what household you have and what type of eating conditions you have. 
I think the menu is the way to go. So it's perfect. I like all these tips. The prep, the prep tips help so much. I, I hope someone's writing this down because I go through a lot of them, but I'll be having Mary you. So where we are right now, you saw me a uh, little olive oil, some salt through the um, diced butternut squash in there, the roasting off at 475. If you want to skip that entire, that entire thing with the roasting, you want to just get right to the meat of it. Mary even said correctly, go to the freezer section, go ahead and grab it already frozen. And I'll tell you when to add those frozen pieces when you go ahead and do that. Onions, what I think is the foundation for a lot of my cooking. What I've done is I've taken the onion, I've cut it in half, taken the top and bottom off, pull the skin off, okay? And this is what I like to do as far as practicing my knife techniques because we're gonna be cooking this in this pot back here, but I wanna make sure there isn't like a giant ch chunk of onion and a tiny sliver of onion. I wanna make sure it all cooks uniformly. And the best way to do that is to continue cutting parallel with the top and the bottom that I took off. Does that make sense? Took it off, sliced it up, and I've cut quarter inch slices. And all I'm gonna do now is just turn it. That's all I've done, just turn it 90 degrees. And then what I'll do is I'll take my knife, pretty low, and as I'm cutting, my knife goes toward the zenith or toward the top. And now all I have to do is just move all this out of the way, tip it over and continue cutting in the same direction, okay? I'm gonna do the other side now. Here we go. Here we go, can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So this was the top and bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and hold it in there. Hold on the red line, hold on, hold, turn it, just get that away so you can see. And then start this lower angle, moving up, tilt it over, which makes it accessible to the rest of my knife and just bang it all out, okay? That is a pretty decent foundation. In my pot, I'm gonna put a couple tablespoons of olive oil. I like a pretty big pot. You know, you can cut these recipes in half or you can double them, whatever you wanna do and then freeze it later on. What's unnecessary is to have the heat blazing on right now because it'll eventually cook. You don't have to worry about like running after the heat. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the onions now. Just drop it in. And everybody should have a food it's scrape. Going, okay? Mary Eve said everyone should have a, a bench scraper. Yeah, <laughs> so, bench scraper, yeah. So oh my gosh. Scraper. So my sister watches these and she's like, what's that? What's that thing he has? What's that thing he has? I'm like, oh my gosh, Vicky, go get a scraper. We yeah. found one the other day. We were together shopping. She's like, it's changed my life. Oh, <laughs> it, yes. And it does. It really does. Because two things I, I always advise people to have. And one is a decent sized cutting board. Pretty big. Doesn't have to be a thick one, but a really big one because I can chop onions and put it over here. The garlic can go over there. Maybe the carrots here, celery there. If I have a small cutting board, that means I have to get out so many bowls and just fill them up with stuff. So I'm going to crank on the heat. It's not like a medium. Doesn't have to be too crazy. I also want to welcome Amo from Lesotho, who has joined us. Well, welcome. Everyone is. And Elvira, welcome. My heart's on fire. Elvira, here we go. So this is what I've done so far. Onions, a little bit of salt, pepper salt, and some olive oil. This goes on medium heat. I put a lid on. Yes, I did put a lid on. The reason I did that is because you have the heat that's coming up. If I wanted to caramelize, I would keep the lid off, but I want it to cook through faster and sort of like really sort of tenderize and get softened very fast. And the way to do that is to keep the steam inside. So you get a little bit of steam and a little bit of caramelization at the same time. While that's happening, let's move on to the stick, okay? A flank stick. One of the things that we chefs and some butcher friends always love is, well, what is the, if you, if you eat beef, what is the beefiest and least expensive cut there is? And I think this is it, flank steak. It's right here along the flank side of the steer or cattle. And what happens is it's super cooked really, really fast. And you can make it super tender. And the way to do that is, well, you can either chew it. That's one way to tenderize it. But let's do it beforehand, which is with a fork, okay? This is a $10,000 fork that you can buy through <laughs> maryeves.com. <laughs> forks, all right. No, it's just a regular fork. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Just a fork. And what you'll do is you'll just simply tenderize it. This is a way of breaking up the structure of the fibers of the meat. 
Another really good thing is that when you look at it, all the fibers, it's like wood grain. It's just all running in one direction. Some cuts of beef or fish or whatever, they're all like, not fish, but you know, chicken, but they go in different directions. This is super easy. It's a lot like this bamboo board. They're all going top to bottom. Same with this stick, okay? And the reason I bring that up is when we serve it, we're gonna slice against the grain. Always slice against the grain. If you're in a restaurant, you're at home, or wherever you are, somebody get, comes and brings you a piece of meat, always slice against the grain because it's going to shorten those fibers and make it much more tender. This is going to make it much more tender because we're breaking up those fibers mechanically with this $10,000 board. Again, maryeve.com, you can find that for it. Really simple, as many times as you want, okay? So that's what we got. We have a flank steak. You want to make sure you have a pan. You want me to move this over? All right, cool. I'm gonna move this. Uh, I'm gonna move this pan over so you can see the steak. You see this one so far? So there's no caramelization happening, which is good. <laughs> hey, Chef, the other thing that you're doing, I want people to realize what you're doing. And if you notice, you're keeping your meat on a different cutting board than other things. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that you're not cross contaminating, right? Yeah. My meat with with other things. So that's something that every home chef cook should do is you have cutting boards for raw meat and then you have cutting boards for other things. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do is I even have another cutting board for when I'm slicing it because this is where raw meat goes. Yep. I'll cook it and it's going to land on this cutting board. Okay. Great. Very good. Thank you for pointing that out. So I have this steak. It's ready to go. I have a very large pan. This is a, what we like to call in the industry, a stick pan. This is not a non-stick pan. This is a sticky <laughs> stick pan, okay? I only use non-stick for one thing, and that's just eggs. And then no metal get ne gets near it. Just one pan just for eggs. This is my stick pan. I'm going to crank it up like medium high, and I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to let it get nice and hot. If your pan is nice and hot, if it's nice and hot, it won't stick. There's a couple other things I want to do. With beef, I want to season it pretty assertively. And the way to do that is to get kosher salt, not iodized salt or table salt. Those are good for like a sore throat. Fine, keep it for that, but not for cooking. Kosher salt. And I'm going to season it from way up here. Okay? And my wrist is sort of like spiraling as I'm going. I'm not seasoning way down here because you know, God bless that person that eats that one bite that has a half a teaspoon of salt in it, all right? Then I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing with the other side. I'm going to season it up nice. And then another little chef tip I'm going to show you is whatever oil you're using, I like to use a neutral oil. That would be like um, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, canola oil works as well, is instead of adding the oil to the pan, which spatters all over the place and cleanups, cleanup is a pain in the bottom. And plus this is my one nice shirt as we pointed out, and I don't want any spatter on it. What you can do is take a little bit of oil and just massage the oil all over the surface of the steak. And that way you won't have any excess oil spattering all the way around the pan, okay? If you have a tendency to have things that smoke a lot. You don't have a decent hood. This is something you do on your grill. It's 83 degrees outside. I could easily do this exact same thing on the grill. Preheat your grill, season and oil the steak, okay? And Chef, that's a really good point because you wanna use an oil that has a high smoke point. Correct. You don't wanna be using like an olive oil in this preparation because when you have a smoking oil, that's actually a carcinogen that causes cancer. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna oxidize. So the smoke point of some of these are 100, 150 degrees higher. So what we'll do is we're gonna get this pan nice and hot, hotter than you may think, because if the pan's not that hot, it's gonna encourage this to steam. And when it steams, you don't get a lot of color and it starts to it's thinking about sticking. But when it's really hot, once the steak or fish or chicken or even a big thing of vegetables goes in the pan, the temperature bottoms out pretty quickly. So you want to start out a little bit hotter than you may think you want. Okay. So who's ready? Who's ready for? We need like a sound effect of like yeah, like a game show. Yeah, we start out. Oh, 
So Mary is doing the drum roll. <laughs> I don't know what the cheering is, but in my head, there's so much cheering, all right? So I think we're pretty hot, pretty darn hot. What we need is a decent sizzle. We need to hear the cheer, the cheering of the audience when this thing goes <laughs> Brit's in. Britt's asking, uh, can you give an example of what type of oil you are using instead? Yes. So the, the, the neutral oils which means like, for example, if I want to make um, mayonnaise, I wouldn't make it with olive oil because it's a very strong olive flavor, but I could make it with grape seed oil that has a very high smoke point. Um, this is sunflower oil, also a very high smoke point, and canola oil. Those canola. Two, I like grape seed the best. Yeah. Right? Great, great question. Anything lower than that, as Mary Eve said, it's going to have a lower smoke point, and that's not really great for your health or for the amount of smoke that's going to happen behind me in just a few seconds. So I'm gonna put this in, I'm not gonna to touch it. Don't touch it, here we go. Okay, it's a small applause, but it's still there. It's a small, it's like a theater. It's like a community college theater, okay? This isn't the Kennedy Center. This is the small theater. It could golf, be, golf, but, golf, golf clap, golf clap. Golf clap. It could, thank golf you, thank you very much, thank you. I'll get that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Golf clap, I love it. So, this is a really sneaky chef thing. This is why restaurant food turns out the same, if not maybe slightly better than home cooked food. It's little tricks like this. This starting to smoke, that's okay. Okay, starting to smoke. What I wanna do is I wanna flip this every minute until an internal temperature of 120. Holidays are coming up true. If you don't have a digital thermometer, get one. If you overcooked your turkey for Thanksgiving, it's because you didn't have a really good thermometer. Okay, always have a good thermometer on hand. I like medium rare, so I'm gonna pull this thing off the heat when it hits 120 internal temperature. There's no fancy like squeeze your thumb to your whatever and then cut your earlobe, that's medium rare. Doesn't count. This is what counts, the science, okay? So every minute I'm gonna flip it. So while you uh, do your flipping, which is how long is that whole this whole process? Do you think? Well, this is like a pound and a quarter, so I'd probably go seven minutes total. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to chase the juice along the inside of the beef because normally you put a steak on the grill and then you flip it and you see the juice coming up through the seared side. I don't want to wait that long. I just keep it going so it's like ping pong with the juice to make sure that the steak is really juicy and doesn't lose a lot of juice. When I'm slicing into it. Okay? So while you do a little bit of that, I have a question for Mary Eve on deck. Uh, since starting stomach cancer treatment, I have struggled with swallowing. No one can tell me why I sometimes choke on my meals. What should I do to stay well with my nutrition during treatment? Yeah, so that can be a common thing. Um, it can be related to the treatment itself, the disease itself. Um, sometimes it's appetite related. Like people will tell me like, I just can't swallow. I'm like, well, tell me what that means. And like, I chew and I chew and I chew. And it's like, well, it doesn't want to go down. It could be the appetite center of the brain is not engaged as well as it could be. So the whole time you're chewing, you're like telling myself to swallow. Um, so using foods that are already kind of soft to moist, is just going to help that whole process and taking small bites also can help. So I think of like casseroles. Um, I think of blended soup. So when you were eating a soup, sometimes they'll just do the liquid part of it and then leave all the other things. But if you blend it with the immersion blender, if you blend it all the way through, it's one consistency. So I can, you know, I can drink that. I think of yogurt. I think of cottage cheese. I think of mashed potatoes, egg dishes. I think of all of those things that don't need a lot of chewing and that just kind of go down pretty easy. The other thing I tell people to do is if you're going to moisten something, add nutrition at the same time. So I had a, a patient last week and she's like, I, I'm really, really liking, you know, baked potatoes. And what I've been doing is, is I've been putting Alfredo sauce on them. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so smart. Um, and she just bought a jarred Alfredo sauce and uh, poured that on it. And then we talked about using minced uh, chicken in there um, as well. I had another patient uh, he was taking like prepared soups and then adding baby meats to it to increase the protein in it. I think those are all really wise things. They kind of get lost in, in, in you're not picking up the one thing. It's just kind of this moist kind of thing going down. So can I add a 
a cheese sauce to something? Can I add a cream sauce to something? Can I put gravy on something? Can I put mayonnaise or sour cream or guacamole? You know, all of those things add moisture and nutrition at the same time. Sometimes people are like, I'm, I'm drinking a lot of water to get things to go down. And I'm like, well, you're just displacing your solid food and diluting your nutrition. So adding moisture in a way that adds calories and protein is, I call it double downing. It's a, it, it, it's a, it's a win-win. Well, we are using your favorite kitchen tool, the immersion wand today, Mary. So get ready to get, I don't know what, do we have a dance with that? <laughs> this, I don't, that, I just feel lost. This is not even a move, okay? So where are we at right now? Melanie says, Mary Eve is my spirit animal. She's, <laughs> that's true. I, got I feel the same way. <laughs> we all need a spirit animal. All right. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Aren't we so lucky to have Mary Eve join us for oh these? Gosh. Oh my God. Oh, sweet. Well, I mean, what so a fountain of knowledge. Sarah I mean, it's and I incredible. Are what, do, what do we do with this? Well, I mean, luckily, Mary Eve has certain cooking pointers that I don't have, but we'll soon <laughs> yeah. put in my back pocket for our road trip. Well, I just learned I'm cutting my onion wrong. <laughs> sharp knife, sharp knife, so it's good to go. Jeez. Okay. So I've been flipping this thing roughly every minute, okay? There's no, there's no juice coming up through the surface as it's been seared. There's no, like, um, I think the old adage when I was going to culinary school in my 30s was, you know, when you sear, sear the meat, it seals in the juices, absolutely wrong. Because whenever you flip a steak, normally you see the juice comes up through the part that's been seared. That's not happening here. It's really high heat. It's giving it great color, but it's the flipping every minute. It's keeping it to where you know, the heat is, is, is cooking it equally from both sides. Because otherwise, if I just put a steak in there, I can literally just rest my hand on top of that steak and nothing's gonna happen. It's not even hot. But this way, the heat, I just keep it going and all the juice stays in the middle. And we're pretty close. How do I know? Well, it's because I have a digital thermometer. I'm gonna pull it at 120 degrees. Oh yeah, we're good. We're definitely good. Yay. Pull that bad boy out. That happened pretty quickly. Happened very quickly. This goes over in the in the don't touch section. That's the do not touch section. I'm gonna pull the soup back in front so you can see what's going on in here. All right. That's a lot of lovely steam. Turn that back on. Okay. So the onions. The onions are cooked through, which is pretty great. They don't need that caramelization. They don't need all that color, all that stuff that's going on. So the onions are pretty much done. Now what I want to do is build on all that flavor. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and add some onions. Well, the onions are garlic that I've sliced up. Just a couple of garlic cloves. So the garlic goes in there. Curry powder has a lot of different spices in it, depending upon whether you like curry or not. That sounds great. So we'll give a little splash of curry in there. Melanie said, the, the one who, uh, Mary Eva's her spirit animal, she says, I'm living 14 years without a stomach from a stage four stomach oh. cancer diagnosis. And I learn things every time I watch Chef Nathan and Mary Eve rock. Oh, that's awesome. Well, if it wasn't for, you know, a very close friend of mine, um, Hans Rufert, who actually made this introduction between myself and the foundation and Mary Eve, I wouldn't be here. So I, I'm always just absolutely honored and blessed to be a part of this, to be a part of this whole family, you know, to see what's going on. Um, that being said, as a, as a chef, as a cook, I do want to make sure that I give as much information as possible. I have a couple spices that went in there. I don't need a lot of color for that. Yeah, I just need to go ahead and get started and put in some stock. This is vegetable stock, you can use chicken stock, the one thing I do not like, and I'm going to go on the record to say this, is I don't like box stock. I saved a poor soul at the grocery store yesterday and said, please don't get that box stock. Instead, get better than bullion. Doesn't I, bullion. I like the flavor of this. The other thing I would have patients or people who are having struggling with protein, there's a lot of high protein broth on the market and not just bone broth. So there is a whole line of bariatric products that are specifically designed for people who've had gastrectomy or gastric bypass. 
they can be between 15 and 21 grams of protein per cup. Wow. Whoa. That's, that's, I feel like I should go to the gym now. And yeah, but it's, it, so you can sip on them um, or you can add them, you know, to, to a recipe. The other thing I want to mention really quickly is, you know, curry powder has turmeric in it and turmeric is a root. It's part of the ginger family and it has very high antioxidant properties. So it's very health promoting. But if you are in active chemotherapy, you cannot do turmeric. It will interfere with your treatment. Ooh. So, okay, good to know. Yeah. So, um, but after your journey of your treatment, totally including turmeric in your diet is a very, very cancer preventative property. So, fascinating. Taking taking the lead from Mary Eve, if you don't want to do curry and you want to sort of palm that down, you could do. I'm guessing maybe we'll have to ask fresh ginger. Would that yep. all be okay? Okay, great. So we'll do fresh ginger and some cinnamon and maybe a little orange zest. And then we'd be in the ballpark of absolute perfection. That's that awesome. sounds awesome. Uh, awesome. And ginger is also another digestive aid. So if you're having, you know, nausea with your treatment, um, putting some ginger into your diet can really help alleviate nausea. Well, much like the $10,000 forks, you can get this juice blend that Mary is kind of talking about <laughs> on maryeve.com. Uh, she's not your head. She's not your head. No. All right. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, yeah. I have a question for Mary Eve from Britt. Um, what are your thoughts on the quote, natural flavors that are present in a lot of the broths, boxed in better than bouillon? I'm thinking they're essence of things. I don't think that they're a, a risk of anything. Um, so I don't actually have a, a negative thought about natural flavorings. I think it's essence. Okay. okay. That's a good question. Good yeah, question. great question. So one of the other things I'm making today for our, I mean, there's gotta be at least a handful of us. So I'm making a lot of food so we can all eat some lunch or dinner or breakfast, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, potatoes, I love a good potato. You can use a uh, Yukon gold potato, not a russet potato. These little fingerling guys are great. Because they're new potatoes and the skins are nice and soft. You don't have to peel them off. They're lovely. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cook them, or I am cooking them, starting in cold water with a little bit of salt. But I'm going to show you how I like to how I like to cut these up. I'm going to serve them after I drain them with a lovely like lemon citronette. Okay, that it's going to have um, some um, some oregano, some lovely flavors. But you want to make sure you cut them small enough to where they fit on a fork. Okay, so if your guests are eating, you don't want like this. So you want to make sure you cut them up. And what I like to do is instead of cutting them in rounds or little coins, I like to sort of roll the potato and twist it and turn it to where you get these really funky different textures that are going on. So when you're eating something, food is lovely from a visual perspective. That's why plating is so important. But when you're eating something, textures can play such a wonderful role in the dining experience, regardless of how much or how little you can eat. So instead of just doing a regular coin, you know, of a potato or a carrot, get funky with it. That's gotta be a t-shirt for our <laughs> 2023, get funky with it, Mary Eve garden tour of whatever <laughs> thing it's called. So but chef, what you just said is so powerful in that I don't have an appetite. I don't wanna eat. I don't wanna do anything. But if I sit down to a beautiful plate of something, I'm gonna be like, hmm, mm -hmm. that's enjoyable looking. Maybe it will be enjoyable to eat it. For sure, absolutely. Because I, because I, you know, I've had you know, growing up in the '70s in Arlington, Virginia. My mom, she's she's a good cook, but at the same token, you know, if something looks really good. Uh, I'm more likely to have seconds. <laughs> that's for darn sure. And when things are again, I can't say it enough. When things are in season. They just work naturally. They just, all these things work. Like when you have pomegranate and apple and orange juice, all those things are in season right now. You can make a really lovely salad, like a kale salad, and they all go together naturally. We don't have to spend a lot of money. Nutrition's really high, and the flavor is just on point big time. Things that grow in the same season always go together. Absolutely. And the other thing is, and we talked about, you know, there's more nutrition if it's grown uh, closer to closer to me, but it also gets me eating more variety of things. You know, if I'm just eating bananas all year and apples all year, I'm missing out on pears and citrus and berries. And so 
that gets you the variety of what you need to do because you really want a variety in vegetable nutrition. Each color of a vegetable gives me a different cancer fighter. So I want things that are orange, yellow, red, purple, white, because even one of those, I'm going to get an allele. I'm going to get a carotenoid. I'm going to, you know, you're going to get different phytonutrients or cancer fighters in my diet. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, summertime and also fall, really, really great. So you think of like, you know, things that are cooked really quick, like a sauteed, you know, sauteed uh, warm salads, one of those things that I think people underestimate, they don't make enough, you know, leafy, leafy greens. Um, we're just super fortunate to be alive in the time that we are right now because the farmers markets and grocery stores are on offer all the time and you're exactly right. Think about the commercials that you see for food. And I always tell people, if you see a commercial for a type of food, don't eat it. If you see a commercial for a hungry man dinner, don't eat it. If you see a commercial for fast food, don't eat it. You never see a commercial for a farmer's market. So you want to eat those things, okay? So keep that in mind. Whatever, whatever we're marketing toward people to eat, just don't eat it. That's a good, just don't eat it. Just don't eat it. Seems like a strange thing this is for a chef I to have say, a but there you go. Question for Mary Eve, but I'll let you get set up on what you're going to do here. Yes, of course. So we don't hear that. All right. Okay, the only commercial uh, that I think of a food that people should eat are nuts. So the- Yes. The, yeah. So nuts, tree and particularly tree nuts, not so much peanuts, but tree nuts. Um, and again, this is evidence-based in science. When you have an ounce a day, those people had less colorectal cancer. Jeez. <gasps> wow. And they go really great in a salad, right? So, and then I know chef's going to tell me this. And if I roast them a little bit, I'm going to get more nutrition out of it and it's going to taste better. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And Unfortunately, we do know each other. So normally I would say, we don't know each other. Nothing, <laughs> nothing up to sleep. You're exactly right. There's something about the roasted nuts, which is really wonderful. You want to roast them much like fresh spices or fresh coffee. Clearly I'm on coffee right now. Um, to give you a little bit more punch as far as that flavor and a little bit more excitement as well. Okay. So what I have in front of me right now is a mascarpone cheese. Mascarpone cheese. Uh, heavy whipping cream. A little bit of vanilla extract. And if you want to do some powdered sugar to stiffen it up just a touch, we can do a touch of powdered sugar to sweeten it. Don't have to, but I'm going to do a little bit of powdered sugar as well. And this is like a chef secret, just, just those four ingredients, vanilla extract, the mascarpone, uh, powdered sugar, heavy whipping cream. I'm just going to whip it up. So let me, let me get this question for uh, Mary Eve here. Good question. Will you turn that off? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, okay, question. I lost what I feel is a great amount of weight from treatment and surgery. I'm trying to gain weight, but I haven't had success. How can I gain weight despite being able to eat uh, much at any one time? Not being able to eat much at any one time. Yeah, so that's a pretty common universal uh, problem. You know, we need more nutrition during treatment and then post-op. At the same time, I need all this nutrition, but I can only handle, you know, half a cup of what I'm eating. Um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit different, but I'm gonna talk about a different product. So fats, um, are our most caloric per portion of things that we can eat, but they're also hard to digest. So they fill us up, um, they slow down gastric emptying. So using a product called MCT oil can work really well. So fats have very long carbon chains chemically. It just takes a lot of digestion. MCT, which is medium chain triglycerides are short so they're very gut friendly and they're 120, 125 calories, a tablespoon, and they can go into soft foods. I can stir it into oatmeal or cream of wheat or, or grits. I can put it in a soup. I can add it to applesauce. I can add it to yogurt. It's a really easy way to double almost the nutrition in what I'm eating without increasing the volume of how much I'm having to, to eat. The other would be is drinking something that has nutrition in it. And that can be a little bit difficult sometimes after surgery, just because they may dump on me if they have a lot of sugar in them. Because sugar, if it falls into the small bowel, the body pulls a bunch of blood and water in, and then I can feel sick, cold, got to lay down, diarrhea. If you find a product that has MCT oil in it as a nutritional drink, that's a great idea. And there's a couple of them on the market that you could search, MCT, peptide drinks, this bariatric line, they also have uh, nutrition drinks. 
instead of buying a commercial one that has a bunch of sugar in it, I think that that would be a really good way to also get some nutrition in, but drinking in between eating these things, because I can't eat and drink at the same time after surgery. So adding MCT to my meals and then drinking nutrition drink in between is an easy way to get more calories in. That's amazing that those types of products are even on offer, that they're on the market. It's incredible. Those are great questions. And thank you again for being this. <laughs> you, you know, there are some people in my life, I look at them and I spend time with them and I think that person makes me want to be a better person. And I spend time with you, Mary, even I think I know nothing, John Snow. I know nothing. <laughs> so hopefully I'll, I'll become a better chef uh, with this wealth of knowledge. You just keep throwing down on us. So what I did was with this up, okay, this mascarpone, heavy whipping cream, a little bit of vanilla extract. You can go powdered sugar or not, again, depending on where you are in your treatment, um, but it stiffens up just like whipped cream. This will hold for many, many days in the fridge. You don't necessarily need the sugar because we're gonna add some fresh berries or some you know, canned peaches or whatever you need, okay? So what I have here, these potatoes, because they're very small, should be done right now. When you check to see if they're done, use Mary Eve's 10,000 dollar fork. Don't use a knife. A knife will pierce it too quickly. And the tines of a fork, that looks nice. The tines of a fork will go in and be more of a true um, indicator of whether potatoes are done. So I'm going to do a quick drain. I'm just going to be out of sight for just a couple seconds. All right. I'm going to go back in the potato. There we go. I'm just going to keep them here for just a second while I make a really quick vinaigrette for you. Okay. We have a salad. Yes, we have a salad. It's not a lot of time, but this is how we roll. Okay. So I'm going to do some lemon juice. This is a little citronette because there's no vinegar. A little lemon juice, olive oil, salt, and pepper. And that's, that's it. Okay. It doesn't have to be complicated to be delicious. And these things, you know, pretty much have all this stuff on offer. Not difficult to find at grocery stores. There we go. And I'll just give this a quick little whisk around here. Okay. Here we are. This I can pour right over the top of the arugula. That salad's good. And guess what? This bowl still has a lot of flavor in it. I'm going to go ahead and use it to make the seasoning for those potatoes that I already drained. What do we got? Well, we got some different acids. I have some lemon juice again, because I still have it. Gonna go some lemon juice. I have shallot. If you like a little bit of shallot for some crunch, you can pop that in there. That residual heat from the potatoes will sort of soften it up, give it a little extra flavor. Okay. I also have chives. If you like a little chive. If you're on your first date, maybe not use the chives. It's one of those things that when you look across the table of your beloved and they've got chive in their teeth, well, joke's on you. You added some chives. I like it because Sarah and I have been together for a long time. And you know what? That's what love does to you. It makes you want to add chives to things. So chives go in. A little bit of olive oil. Bob's your uncle. We're good with that. Then I'll add the potatoes back in. There we go. And that heat will help them soak up all that yumminess. Okay, there are my potatoes. Didn't take a long to cook. Steamy, dreamy. Steamy, dreamy foundation, all right? Now what happens is those warm potatoes are gonna suck up all that lovely citronette, all that flavor. Those potatoes are done, okay? So now, as Mary Eve talked about, I do have a steak that's been resting for a long time. That's good. You want the steak to rest. If it doesn't rest, all the juice will just go out everywhere. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and use a chef's knife for this. My regular old chef's knife. Okay. Now, as we talked about in the very beginning, all the fibers are going one direction. You want to slice against the fibers. Okay. You want a sharp knife as well. And you want to do it in the least amount of strokes possible. What I don't want to have happen is watch people do this. And they get one slice. What you want. You why, want don't, why isn't that good? What you're doing is you're tearing at the fibers. If you've ever gone to like a, to like a, you know, somebody's, somebody's 
fancy house or some of these fancy golf club or whatever. And those dudes with the toques, and the big jackets and the heat lamps have got these really long knives like this. This is a slicing knife. It's specifically long to make sure you don't do that. You don't want to tear the meat so all the juice goes everywhere. What they do is they take these really long knives and they go loop one, loop two, loop three, super long, really thin, pink as can be, tender as heck. Look at that, I'm not even looking. Not even looking. No. <laughs> no, nope. Mary Eve, I can do this. I've done this on TV. I don't, I don't want a fingernail or a <laughs> finger in my face. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have any fingernails left, so you'll never get a fingernail in your food. I promise. All right. So that's why they have really long knives. So they have one long stroke. If you have just a regular chef's knife, make sure it's nice and sharp, so you can just go ahead and go up and back. No sawing or anything like that. Okay. So this, this, I mean, it all looks pretty darn good. Like, where do you even begin? Well, how about we begin with a plate, a plate, and a dream. I was about to bust out in the song, don't make me. So the steak is ready to go. We have our fresh berries and I'm gonna put over next to the whipped uh, mascarpone, which is lovely for dessert. That for you. We'll give this one a second, thanks. Mm -hmm. And like magic, we have a beautiful area in which to put some, some plates down, okay? So let's plate our main, yeah, let's plate our main, shall we? Let's make something really beautiful here. Big lovely plates. Okay. Let's go ahead and start with the potatoes. Some feta. Oh, yes, some feta, of course. For those of you that love a little bit of cheese as well, I recommend a touch of feta. And I added at the end because when the potatoes are nice and warm, they have a tendency to soften the feta a little bit. When you stir it, it gets kind of funky looking. I like a burst of lemon, a burst of the onion or the chive, and then a little bit of the feta as well. You can also plate it and then add feta after you're done. Okay, so the feta is off the side. There we go. So if, 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 if people are suffering with appetite problems, yes. um, same thing, pretty plate, but you might want to do a sandwich plate or a salad plate. Got it. Um, because when somebody doesn't want to eat, they don't want to look at a lot of food because the, the response is like, oh, I can't do that. But if it's small, I call it toddler eating, you know, little portions okay. to the eye and to the appetite center of the brain, it's much more doable. Right. Which that is, makes sense. you know, it's kind of like, I grew up with two older brothers and my, my mom would always say, get a small plate. If you're still hungry, go back and get more and then go back and get more, go back and get more. So you're exactly right. It is more manageable, which is why in fancy restaurants, they give you a giant size plate and a small little tiny one ounce thing of meat with a <laughs> dropper, like an eyedropper of sauce. But like, sir, here's your $60. <laughs> and at home, we're just like, blah, 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 blah. okay, so there is a lovely fresh, um, like, a, like a potato feta thing that's going on here. Vibrancy is from the citronette. A little bit of crunch from the shallot. This arugula salad, super duper easy. It's one of my favorite things to make at like a dinner party where I'm catering. You want to dress it the last second. And what that means is, you know, you've got your, your lemon juice, your olive oil. It's actually the olive oil or oil that is the culprit of breaking down the tissue of those vegetables. So whenever you see your salad and those greens go a little limp, it's not the vinegar, it's not the lemon juice. It's always the oil that sort of inundates in that cell structure and makes it black and flaccid, okay? So that's what's going on. If you want to double down cheese, a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano is really nice with that. Maybe some pine nuts, that would work too. That steak is gonna go right there, okay? So as not to drip all the deliciousness, I'm gonna go ahead and just put it right here, all right? And depending upon where you're sitting, you're seeing that one. You wanna make sure the expensive stuff is facing the client. Mary Eve, that's your puppy, your dachshund. Make sure your dachshund gets some of that beef, okay? I know that dachshunds love beef. So this is your main. We also have a dessert. soup and we have dessert. My goodness, there's so much going on here. Dessert, really simple. Let me show you how to do this. You want these big spoons. This is again, just the whipped mascarpone cheese, a little bit of uh, whipped cream, 
and vanilla extract, powdered sugar if you want it, don't have to. Some fresh berries. And I like to make it like a little moat, like a teeny little moat that you take the spoon like you would with hummus and you just whip, and you put that right in the middle, a couple berries, and you're good to go. Super. Pretty fresh, pretty fresh and so clean. Bum, 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 but don't forget about these asbestos hands. Gah! This is what I want them to look like when they've been roasted efficiently, effectively. This goes in with all the flavors, the onion, the stock, those spices, curry, depending on your or not. And you blend it with an immersion wand. Stop it. That is the prize today. The immersion wand is the thing that makes everything possible. This is your Christmas bonus today. Okay. Mary is doing just, I, mean, I, I feel like getting mine out of my cabinets right behind me. <laughs> so great. It's the best just thing. in solidarity, right? And then you don't be transferring hot soup into a blender and blending it. Jeez. Right. And it can be a little bit treacherous. It can be a little bit nerve-wracking if you have a blender, because as we know. You know, heat expands things, and so the top can just pop right off. You've got a lot of fun things going on here. A lot of flavor. Everything is really made out of minutes. Like, it just was made right in front of you. I don't expect you guys to make this whole meal, but I do hope that one of these things has inspired you to think, yeah, you know what? That, that does seem like something that I would like and my loved one would like, and it's not too difficult. It's definitely in season. It's very nutritive. And maybe it's something that may, may say Thanksgiving or New Year's, and maybe they'll say something that's really fresh and try a different take on something you've always tried, but have never ventured out of to try something slightly different with your potatoes or slightly different with the type of steak you use. And this would work with chicken as well. And a lot of vegetables. I don't even know where we are as far as time. I haven't even broken a sweat that you can see. <laughs> but for the most part, I think we're doing okay. You know, this is a really well-rounded meal again using all seasonal stuff mary eve has guided us through this whole thing like my fairy culinary godmother and um and i just could not be more thrilled to share my love for fresh seasonal cuisine with you yet again big huge space the dream foundation for everyone who works there it's just doing such good work and also my buddy hans rupert chef out of stomach my man text every week my brother because we love coffee, and that's clearly what drives me, <laughs> other than the C cell battery. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for me, or any more questions from Mary Eve? Otherwise, we'll just have some lunch and kick out and have some fun. And we're coming back in 2023. 2023 national what? <laughs> yeah, maybe. We'll have to see. I, I I just want to thank everybody so much. This has just been a fantastic relationship partnership, and I just wish everybody, you know, the best of holidays and. Uh, Healthy, happy 2023. Let's make it delicious. Amen. Yeah, let's make it delicious. All right, everybody. Um, like always, through social media, if you have any more culinary questions, Chef Nathan Lyon on all social media, do not hesitate to send me questions because Sarah and I love, love, love answering them. And it could be something as simple as what kind of knife do you use? What type of pans do you recommend for the holidays, for gift giving? I am here for you just as you are all here for us as a community, okay? So love you guys. Stay safe out there. Enjoy the brisk 83 degrees. 45, 45, 45. Oh, nice. Oh, so lucky. <laughs> Sunny, beautiful day here in Baltimore. Oh my gosh. Well, being a Beltway baby from Arlington, Virginia, I feel you. So um, so let's say hi to everybody there. And, and stick around for a minute um, once uh, these beautiful people jump off your screen so that we can throw up our sponsor slide who also Fantastic. make this totally possible Absolutely. and um, a little bit about 2023. Fantastic. Thank you all. We'll Thank see you. you. Stay safe. Talk to you soon. <laughs>